In the end, John and Susan Letby were unable to accept the reality about their only child's evil deeds, despite being a continuous presence during her 10-month trial. Mr. and Mrs. Letby made the same decision as Lucy, who hid in her jail yesterday and declined to appear at Manchester Crown Court for sentencing. They were absent to hear the heartbreaking testimony of the bereaved parents of the beloved infants who had been killed by their 33-year-old daughter. Or to hear Mr. Justice Gorse announce that she will now live out the rest of her days in prison. However, the pair has been in complete denial about their beloved daughter since the beginning of this horrific odyssey. They are unable or unable to acknowledge that she could have committed the awful acts for which she was put on trial. And, more importantly, they are never hesitant to come to her defense. Six months after being evacuated from the newborn ICU at the Countess of Chester Hospital due to the passing of two triplet boys, Mr. and Mrs. Letby accompanied their daughter to a significant meeting with hospital administrators. The couple supported her in obtaining an apology letter from top physicians who had expressed worries about their darling daughter and threatened to denounce them to the General Medical Council after learning of her innocence. Their narrow-minded faith in their child is not entirely unexpected from them as dedicated parents. Letby is only the fourth female killer in British criminal history to get a whole life sentence. But unlike murderers like Myra Hindley and Rose West, there is little evidence to imply that Letby had a difficult upbringing. Not at all. People who know the family said that Susan, a retired accounts clerk, age 63, and John, a 77-year-old former shop manager, adored their daughter. Even so, some could argue, Letby was born in January 1990, six months after her parents' union, and not long after they'd purchased the Hereford, England, 1930s semi-detached home where they currently reside. According to their neighbors, their daughter was always a joy to her parents. At the comprehensive Aylstone School and afterwards at Hereford Sixth Form College, they witnessed her success. She worked at W.H. Smith as a youngster for her first part-time employment. She earned a BSc in child nursing from the University of Chester in 2011, becoming the first member of the family to graduate. The pair was so happy about this accomplishment that they placed an advertisement in the neighborhood newspaper. After all your effort, it read, We are so proud of you. They repeated this when she turned 21 and included a picture of their daughter as a cute young child with the birthday greeting. A mile from the Countess of Chester Hospital, where she lived alone with her two rescue cats, Tigger and Smudge, despite their alleged displeasure at her leaving Hereford to begin her new career, they assisted Letby in purchasing her first property. It was a £179,000 three-bedroom semi. The revelation of emails Letby sent with co-workers during her trial suggested that she occasionally felt bad about moving away from her parents and was suffocated by them. She continued to take vacations with them, visiting Torquay three times a year as the family had done since she was a young girl. It would have been impossible for her to move, she said to a doctor who was relocating to New Zealand, since it would completely devastate them. She said, they find it hard enough being away from me now, and it's only 100 miles. Another time, she wrote, my parents worry a lot about everything, hate that I live alone, etc. I feel bad because I know it's really hard for them, especially since I'm an only child. They mean well, but sometimes it's a little suffocating, and they constantly feel guilty. Ironically, considering the nature of Letby's crimes, her early years with her parents may hold the key to understanding her often claustrophobic connection with them. Letby wanted to be a neonatal nurse since she too had survived a horrific delivery, according to one of the killer's closest friends, who similarly refuses to recognize her school friend's guilt and went to the same school as her. This was revealed on the BBC Spanorama show last week. If accurate, this might contribute to the understanding of why John and Susan Letby tended to overprotect their daughter.
Another issue completely is how this would have affected Letby as she approached adulthood. According to a psychologist involved in the case, Letby was a covert narcissist. She needed to pursue attention elsewhere since she had been the center of her parents' universe for so long and yearned for it now that she was an adult living independently. Other texts she wrote during her deadly rampage show how she appealed for support and praise from co-workers. After Babia, her first victim, passed away in June 2015, a different nurse wrote to her, I hope you are okay, you are brilliant. Let be retorted. It was the toughest thing I've ever had to do. We were all in for a major shock. It was difficult coming home tonight to see the parents. Some of the nurses' messages. According to Dominic Wilmot, a lecturer in criminology at Loughborough University, indicate that she may have wished to gain sympathy following the deaths of the infants. She could have been driven by a pathological desire for attention and sympathy, he said last week. Letby's desire to win over a doctor she had been infatuated with was another major defense strategy used by the prosecution during her trial. Even the idea that Letby had Munchausen syndrome by proxy, a disorder in which providers purposely hurt children to draw attention to themselves, has been floated. After several of the killings, there are accusations that she became enthusiastic, perhaps relishing the drama she had produced. On July 4, 2018, John Letby was there when his daughter was detained for the first time, following one of the family's vacations to Torquay. He had driven her home the day before and remained the night. He watched as she was escorted out of the house by police officers. When Letby testified in court that her father had prepared her bed following her detention, she was on the verge of tears. Her room was fairly infantile with plenty of plush animals, fairy lights, and a corny sign that read, leave sparkles wherever you go, as the jury could see from photos displayed in court. Happy birthday mummy was written on a message from her cats to her mother, which was found in her kitchen. Letby was first granted bail, and then detained twice more, in June 2019 and November 2020, as the inquiry went on. When she was once detained at the house where she grew up, her distressed mother reportedly begged police to let her go, saying, I did it. Take me rather. The pair, who still manage the family radiator company, moved from Hereford and rented an apartment near to Manchester Crown Court before their daughter's trial began in October. They could now decide to move again in order to be close to Letby when she starts her life sentence in a facility that is probably distant from their current residence. The pair was observed gazing lovingly at their daughter, who frequently tried to lock eyes with them. During the trial, they have occasionally been an irascible presence in court, criticizing media for their coverage of the trial and lamenting its length, which prompted them to extend the lease on their leased flat. They have been determined to hear every piece of evidence against her. During breaks in the proceedings, they both started to become a common sight smoking cigarettes on the courtroom steps. The couple's confidence in Letby has been strong despite everything they have learned about her evil deeds. When the findings were announced last Friday, Mrs. Letby's shock was evident in court as she broke down in tears and cried out, You can't be serious. At one point, this is inexcusable. Another blatant demonstration of their continued support for their daughter was their choice to skip court yesterday. Most parents wouldn't be able to handle having to listen to specifics of the evil she committed day in and day out. It still pales in comparison to the anguish of parents whose helpless pretum newborns were given a shot at life, only to have it murderously taken from them. A straightforward question sits at the center of this horrific narrative. How is it possible that a child reared by such devoted parents could have developed into one of the worst child serial murderers in British history? For the rest of their lives, John and Susan Letby will be debating whether or not they will ever come to accept their daughter's guilt.